Good morning. 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 <laughs> okay, so um, today we're going to predominantly look at doing uh, basic pivot tables in Microsoft Excel. So it might be something that you currently use and have got lots of complicated questions about, which would be great fun. Um, or it might be something you've never heard of and are just um, keen to know a little bit of it. Yeah. So um, I'll run through what they all are and what they do. Um, what I'm going to do at some point today, um, I was going to say I'd do it first, but no, I'll do it last, is pick up on um, one of the things we spoke about yesterday in the mail merge. And um, uh, Michelle mentioned that it would be nice to send out an attachment. And I had a quick look and thought um, this isn't going to be easy. So I'll have a more detailed look. And it wasn't just not easy, it's impossible. We can't send an attachment as part of an email merge um, in Word. Um, however, there are better ways of doing it. So I'm going to go through that later. I won't do that first because um, pivot tables are far too exciting to put off. Okay, so I can, I can sense the excitement. I can see a video screen. Um, okay, yeah, people just turn the cameras off now. Um, so, um, <laughs> So without further ado, here we go, pivot tables. So the general idea of a pivot table in Microsoft Excel is you take a chunk of data, not dissimilar to this data, and, uh, and you analyze it. Um, the idea is normally that you do it with um, data that's got a lot more columns. Uh, normally you do it with data that's got a heck of a lot more rows. And so you, um, this is an invoice list, a very basic invoice list. Um, but you might actually have um, an invoice list with, I don't know, a thousand invoices on it. And there might be uh, sort of 30 different column headings. Um, but this is just a basic, simple thing uh, to give you a general idea. So once you've got data like this, you can do sorts of all sorts of um, analysis with it. Um, we can take things like um, uh, a sum if function, like we saw the other day, and then we can analyze totals to sort of, let's say, um, put my mouse on the screen. I feel like I need to do some kind of interaction in case the laptop falls asleep. Uh, we can do things like get all the, uh, this particular group and add all those totals up and um, put the total here with, uh, with a sum if. Um, we could use the um, auto filter function, which is a really nice, easy way of filtering data so that I can see the total of invoices um, for a certain account or a certain product. Um, and we could do all sorts of analysis in this screen. However, a pivot table will give us a much more, um, a much more complex um, analysis. It basically, the whole point of it being a pivot table is that rather than just analyzing going down the screen, you could analyze going across as well. It'll make more sense if you, when you see it, if you've never seen one before. So like I say, it's a very simple list of invoices here. Um, I've, I've put seconds into creating this. Um, but now what I want to do is I want to analyze it using a pivot table. The great news is since about 2013, I think it was, it was either 2013 or 2016, the latest version of insert pivot table has made it the easiest it's ever been. It really couldn't be any easier. Uh, well, it could be, uh, it'd be voice activated anyway. Um, <laughs> What I'm going to do is I'm going to click in the middle of it to tell it that I'm looking at this data set. When you have, whenever you're working with data sets, you either have to select the whole thing um, or select nothing, basically, in Excel. Um, because if you select just one cell, as I have there, you think, oh, you want all the cells selected, and it'll work it out by itself. If I select all of them, it'll go, oh, you've selected all the cells. If I just select a couple of columns, then it'll get don't get confused, it will think I only want those two columns and things won't work properly. So, what I'm going to do here is insert a pivot table. And so, shockingly enough, I need to go to the Insert tab. On the Insert tab, we can insert all sorts of things into our spreadsheet, like charts and shapes and pictures. Um, but I want the first one, pivot table. And if I click on that, it brings up the dialog box. Now, as I said earlier, this is the easiest it's ever been. And the reason for that is because they got rid of a lot of the functions. It's not that they are no longer available. Um, there is a more detailed version of this dialog box, which asks more questions, uh, which you can um, get to by creating a button for it. But I'm not going to do that because it's really dull. Um, but what they've done instead is they've taken all the important questions and ran them into one screen. 
and they've put the default answers in as being the most likely answers that you're going to want anyway. So for most people, you can just click on insert pivot table and click on OK. Job done, which is, well, I say job done. 5% of the job done. Um, but that's, um, that's a good thing about the latest version. So what we've got here then is there's two key sections to this. The first bit at the top is um, where we're getting the data. And the next bit at the bottom is um, where are we putting the data? And then there's a final question, which basically says, if you like the data so much, why don't you do this sort of thing in the future? Um, which we're not going to do today either. However, at the top, where we're getting the data is it's guessed that I want data from this sheet, the one that um, I'm currently in, which is correct. It's put the full um, address of it in, which has got the sheet name, exclamation mark, and then the cell references with the dollars around them because they're absolute references as we spoke about the other day. Um, so, um, so it's specifically looking at, at that range, which is perfect. If I wanted to be really big and clever, I could use a data source, an external data source to be precise. And then here I can make it connect to things like SQL data or an accounts package or a database. So if I had something in an access database that I wanted to pull out, or if I had, um, I don't know, Sage Payroll, um, and I wanted to bring up uh, this month's pay run figures, I could hook directly into that. And the nice thing about the way the data links especially with things like ODBC linking, which is really easy to set up. Um, you can create a link between a spreadsheet and say, for example, your account system. And then somebody could be um, hitting, um, yeah, somebody could be typing away, hitting the keys, punching in invoices, and you can just press refresh and get that data straight into your spreadsheet or pivot table. So you can do big and complicated things. That's the point I'm getting at. Can I want to just ask a question about that? It's, yes. Um, because my accountant set up um, like this uh, pivot table from Sage, um, to sh so he's picked up. Uh, we pick up a report every week for the um, suppliers, yeah. um, so that it's set up so that it picks up their payment terms to show every thirty days. And yeah. he's done the connection from that report at Sage um, into this into like a massive pivot table. So that's the sort of thing he would do is is click on that to yeah. to be able to do that. Yeah. Exactly that. Yeah. Because yeah. the good thing about that is once you've done all the hard work initially, which is clearly mm. done there, then every time he wants to reanalyze it, you just go in and press refresh or just open the switch yeah. up and it'll refresh anyway. So all the hard work's done. So yeah, it's exactly that. And he'd, he'd come into this sort of setting. Because um, how, how would he set up from Sage to the pivot table um, and, and tell it like it's 30 days, that sort of thing? Is that? It sounds really complicated. Well, it's not, well, it is complicated, um, but it's not difficult. Um, basically, it, when creating the pivot table, you select this option, you say use external data, and then you choose a connection, which I haven't got set up on here because I haven't got yeah. something installed. However, no, what you would do, or um, somebody that's mildly technical, um, one of my colleagues on the help desk maybe could do for you, is um, create an ODBC data connection, which is done from the control panel. Now, when you install Sage, I think it might even create that for you anyway. And then all you do right. from here is when you yeah. click on Choose Connection, you'll see all these mm -hmm. lists of different sources, which if I do that now, um, it will list all the sources that I don't have, which is nothing. Yeah. There's, there's a database mm -hmm. I created. But it would say um, connections on this computer, and it would say Sage Payroll, Sage Accounts, blah, 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 blah. And then I could click on that, and then it would have loads of different um, types of data in there. And I just think no, right, yeah. Yeah. or uh, <clears throat> Mm. I think analyze from there in the pivot table. Right. So, um, so it, it's surprisingly straightforward once it's set up. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's data sources. So once you've got that, then the next thing is deciding where to put it. And again, the default option is the best option, which is a new worksheet. You can put it into an existing uh, worksheet. So in other words, if you've got one of these tabs down the bottom that contains all your pivot tables, all your things to do with analyzing invoices you might want to put it in there but i would say nine and a half times out of ten it's just easier to put it into a new workbook because you've got lots more space and freedom to work with it so i'm going to get on with this now um, by hitting okay i mean basically all i've done there is click in the middle of it and select the default options so it wasn't anything being clever so here's my pivot table 
It's brilliant. It does nothing mm. yet, but it's there. The thing about pivot tables is they're active and they're working on it and they're ready to go straight away, even though there may be no data in it. And sometimes it's a little confusing for people. Um, there is an option down here for people that get easily confused. And what happens is you tick this box and then you spend ages working on your pivot table and nothing appears to happen. Um, and then you delete things and it still doesn't work and you start again. And after about three hours, you realize you have to press the update button to make it do anything. This option is great for people that are scared of the dark, but generally I would highly recommend keeping that unticked and imagine that that never existed. And then just carry on um, creating it and watching it change as you create it, even if it does look a bit overwhelming and scary. So, which of course it isn't because it's only a spreadsheet. Um, so here we have a, uh, a pivot table and every pivot table has four sections to it. You don't have to use all the sections, you can use um, just one of them it wouldn't be much of a pivot table then, or you can use all of them, or you can use any combination. The sections are, and bearing in mind if you've learned this years ago or if you've used older version of different names, but the sections are currently filters, columns, rows, and values. Um, the filters are the overall filters, um, or the page filter or the top level filter for your sheet. So for example, if you was looking to analyze sales of widgets, and there were three different kinds of widgets and you didn't care about cross reference and you just wanted to have one spreadsheet or one table for each widget, then you would set that widget as the top level filter. If you were analyzing by different countries or departments or um, regional offices um, and you wanted to print out a, a report on, let's say, each office, then that would make sense to be the top level filter because you could um, filter the, um, the Birmingham office and then the only data you'd see on that pivot table would be data that relates to that office. Okay, so that's what a top level filter is all about. I didn't really explain the structure of my data beforehand, which would have made more sense. However, I'm assuming that you got that it was a list of invoices and that that's a structured data format. In other words, it's repetitive um, records going down the page. However, if you didn't, I'll explain it. Um, so that's the filter. The page filter. Then you've got columns. Now columns are the headings. They're the ones that go across in a row really easily. Well, really easy to understand. Columns are the ones that go across in a row. Uh, the rows, that's the one that goes down in a column. Okay, so you've got one row of columns across the top and you've got uh, a column of rows down the side. Or to put it other way, they're just the headings. Um, then you've got values and that's the bit in the middle where the magic happens. So what I've got to do now is look at my headings from the previous sheet and um, then I can decide which one of these headings I want to go where. And I don't need to make permanent decisions. I can change this as much as I like. So the top level filter, I'm going to start with rep. So I'm just going to put the sales rep in as a top level filter. So there it is. It's there now. It's active. It's working. I'm going to zoom in to make it bigger because that way then I don't have to wear my glasses and I can just pretend. I'm doing it so that it's clearer on the screen. Um, so there we have rep. And now if I select a specific rep, click on OK, you can only see data that relates to that rep. I mean, I can't see any data on there at all anyway, but that's not the point. I haven't put any on there yet. But that's what that filter, that top level filter is all about. You have a list of all of the um, criteria in that field. In other words, all the, you know, all the different data types in that field. And you can only um, select either all of them or one of them. Unless you want two of them, then you can tick this um, cobble together box. They added it to about 12 years ago, um, which says select multiple. And then you can select two or three or four or whatever data you've got. It's a little bit cobbled together, but it does it sort of works its purpose. Anyway, I'm going to change that back to being normal and just select all. OK, so rep is a top level filter. Now I need some filters to go across, um, no, down the side. I'm going to do the side first of all, and I'm going to use um, account. So let's make it customers. So I'm going to do that, drag that down to row. And so now these are different customer accounts, and um, I could select different reps, <laughs> and I could select different accounts, but there's nothing to, sh to see the results of that. So across the top, I'm going to put analysis code. And the analysis code, which can go in a column, 
are the different product types. So we can pick individual products, we can pick individual rows, not rows, um, accounts, and we can choose by rep. But when the, um, the exciting stuff happens, when I put some figures in, yay! I'm going to take value and stick that into values. That's really badly worded. Anyway, value goes into values, and now I can see stuff. So if I want to see how a particular rep start, I can say, right, let's look at AB, and here's their figures. Let's look at um, NB. There's their figures. Let's look at all of them, et cetera, et cetera. And if I want to look at a specific um, account, I can go to row labels, and I can untick all of them and then choose a specific account, or maybe let's choose two accounts. And they say, okay. And there's my table, and it is jolly well pivoting. So, um, having done that, I just need to check something on my screen. Oh, no, I don't want to do that. That's Excel done. That's it. Right. Um, having done that, I'm going to now change the layout of it and make it. Um, Mildly more interesting. So, um, first of all, I mean, that's okay for analysis, but it's not very exciting. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take those uh, uh, analysis codes and I'm going to put them under the uh, company, the account number. So, I'm going to, I can grab that analysis code. I can either put it back in a suggestion that I don't want it anymore, or I can just drag it straight to where I do want it, I want under account. So, now it kind of looks Mm. So more interesting. I can expand and collapse to drill down on how um, these individual accounts have spent their money. But then I've got all this opportunity for analysing across the top, which is lost. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take date and put that in the column at the top instead. Wow, that's rubbish. Um, with dates, you don't really want it to put all the dates in because if you do that, um, then it'll be useless. You know, but, you know, almost every day on there. We don't really want it to group by year either. So the important thing when it comes to dates is to get the grouping right. So I'm going to right mouse click on that and go to group. Now you can group or ungroup, um, but to be fair, it makes more sense just to go to grouping and ungroup while you're in there. Um, what I want to see is um, I'm going to do quarters because that would be much more interesting. So I don't want years, I don't want months. I can put in date ranges, so if I want to do it in a more specific way, this won't filter, but what it will do is it will um, provide a better date range. So, for example, if nothing happens in the first three months of one year, but you want that represented anyway, then you'd want to put it to start at that time, that kind of thing. Anyway, so I've gone to grouping by right mouse clicking. Now I say, okay, I've got four quarters. Yay! Almost looks interesting. Column width's all a bit of a mess, so if I now adjust the column width, then hurrah, that looks wonderful. Now, um, you notice this pivot um, table field list thing disappears whenever I click away from the pivot table. That's a feature, it's supposed to do that. So now it's in like nice user-friendly, ready-to-go mode. But if I want to edit it and, and change the structure, I need to click in the middle of it, and then it comes back. And if I can't find it, in other words, if it hasn't come back, then I can right mouse click, and select the option at the bottom, which will bring it back, or will hide it if I don't want it. No, I want it, so I'm bringing it back. So there's my table, it's all working. I think, great, it's almost looking acceptable. I'm just going to check some filters and do some anal analyzing, analyze. And then all this rubbish again because the column width screwed up. Uh, and I can adjust it and then do more analysis, and it looks rubbish again. There's a few tips to know about pivot tables that can sometimes take ages to find. The first number one golden tip on pivot tables is turning off auto fit because it's so annoying. Um, we can get to all the pivot table tools up here on the ribbon. And I think it's within the analyze tab on the first bit um, where we find options. It is because it says options there. All the useful stuff we can get to by right mouse clicking and go into options from there. Either way, it's the same screen. Once we well go into options, though, the first thing that I'm interested in seeing is auto fit. I want to untick that, and I never want it ticked ever again. It will tick it again for the next one, not great. But now, if I say OK to that and resize my um, pivot table, next time I make a selection, 
or analyzing one way or another, it doesn't screw it up. It stays that format. It might look like it screwed it up, but that's because it's taken away one of the months, quarters even. Anyway, so that's um, one of the really important things. The other thing is to make your numbers look nice because they will look a bit rubbish. And the best way to format them is to right mouse click and go into the field settings. These three at the bottom are probably the most useful right mouse click options when you're working on pivot tables. Um, in pivot table options, there's a few things in there that are useful, things like formatting um, by merge and centering the headings and changing the way the totals are displayed and other stuff, but I'll come back to that later. But the thing I'm really interested in here is the field settings. And in here, here's my field called sum of value, which isn't really that. Um, well named, but I could change the name in a minute. And the first thing I want to do is change the number format. So I'm going to change it so that um, well, I don't really want decimal places, I just want a comma. So I'm going to change that to zero decimal places and put a thousand separator in because it looks prettier. I'm going to change the name as well from sum of value to im value or in val because that's got a real ring to it <clears throat> you can do other things here you can change the function that it's doing because sometimes you don't want it to just add them up i'll come back to that in a minute so when i hit ok i've now got a mildly presentable pivot table um, i can go to um, the options up here and i can do various things to tinker with the way it works or to refresh the data um, I can change a data source if I've um, got it linked to a spreadsheet or, or something else that is then in a different place. And I can click on the design tab to change a colour scheme. Um, these colour schemes, well, there's a lot to choose from. Some of them look awful and the rest of them just look really bad. Um, but um, I'm not going to change it because I'm already putting up with this colour scheme. But there are things like you can change how um, things are banded to make them stand out, that sort of stuff. So that's got its uses. But there's my basic pivot table, and I can do pivoting and stuff. Um, what I'm going to do now, as another um, level of excitement, is um, I'm going to add another value field to it. Now, I haven't really got anything else in the way of fields that I could add that's a value field. The only field I've got left is the invoice number. However, the great thing about invoice numbers is they're unique. So if I take that and stick it into values, it will now give me um, the sum of the invoice number, which is just ridiculous. I don't want my invoice numbers added up. But again, if I click on that right mouse click and go to um, settings, I can change it from sum to count. Now what that'll do is tell me how many invoices there were. Um, the reason of that, I'm going to call it no invoice, as in number. Um, the reason I might want to do that is to see how many invoices went out that quarter or month or to that client or something. Um, and because they're unique numbers, it's um, sort of almost useful. I say almost. Um, Anyway, there's my uh, pivot table. There's a total of invoices gone out, and there's a, a need for some tidying up and formatting. Um, that's pretty much it for basic, um, the basic pivot table. What else can I say about that? We can do various formatting things, but we can also do, um, we can add fields in there, calculations. There isn't really anything to calculate there on except for the value. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a field in to work out the VAT. It's not really a, a sensible thing for this spreadsheet, but I'm going to do it anyway, just to show how to do a calculation. Um, so if I go to Analyze and go to Fields, Items and Sets, I can say Calculated Field. If I click on that, then here I can give my field a name and I'm going to call it VAT, because that's a familiar thing that we would know about. And then I'm going to put a formula in to calculate it. And VAT equals, let's say, the uh, invoice value times 20%. Now, if I click on Add, 
It'll add that to the list of fields. And I think if I click on OK, it'll even add it to the spreadsheet, depending on how it's feeling about it. But within this field list, I can click on the drop down and I can see a list of all of the um, calculated fields, of which I've just created one. And if I don't want one anymore, I can click on delete and then I'll get rid of it. But I finished there and uh, yeah, it's put it in even though I didn't ask for it. But there we go. Some of that is right there. And if I think that looks ridiculous, um, because it is, I can take it back out again, like so. And there you go. That's a basic pivot table. Any questions? Um, <clears throat> yeah. When you when you started off and you transferred the data from the spreadsheet to the pivot table, yeah. does it automatically, how does it know that you want that data or some other data? Does it automatically just pick that up? Or yeah. did, you, did I miss... <laughs> Oh, it does. All well, right. It guesses at it. Um, the bits right. where, um, if I click on the data source, um, it will show me the bit that it guessed at. That's what it did in the beginning. There was a, yeah. a little bit uh, more detailed than this, but because I put the cursor in the middle of the data, it guessed right. I wanted the whole section. Um, right. If I selected just three columns, it would assume that I want just those three columns. And where it right. says range there, which is probably difficult to see on the screen, um, yeah. it's really small. That's the, the, the actual exact absolute reference of that data. Sheet for exclamation mark A1 to F18. So oh, right, that's okay. what it's looking for. But of course, if we was pulling in from Sage, we'd click on that, which mm. we can't do now. <laughs> and I'd yeah. click on choose connection and uh, select the ODBC driver thingy, as it's technically known. Yeah, can you use it? I mean, obviously you probably can, can't you? But if, if you're... So you've got um, like um, direct debits, like we said before, and they're all out of order. I could use it for that as well, couldn't I, really, to put into months and that sort of thing? Yeah, we can do that. We can do that another way. I mean, we can yeah. sort the data quite easily on the other yeah. screen. Uh, we can group the data or we can use subtotaling, which are also really useful things. I'll go through those yeah. later if you like. I can yeah. the script. Yeah. <laughs> um, or is there anything else you'd like to know about pivot tables? Or are you happy with that one now? Mm. Or would you like me to create another one? It sound flipping hard to me, but... <laughs> <laughs> Let me show you another I'm one. I'm not used to using them, so... Oh, God. Well, let's do it. I'll do it off from scratch. I'm, I'm only going to do this because I spent ages doing this data. And by ages, I mean almost two minutes. Um, mm. Here's a more detailed version of the data that took me less than a minute to create. Uh, so, if I click in the middle of it, it'd have to be the middle, it could be the corner, but I like the dramatic effect of that. Go to insert, say pivot table, boom, there's a dialog box. It's picked up the details from this sheet six, A1 to whatever it is. Um, it's suggested that I put it to a new workbook, um, in other words, a new tab at the bottom, which is exactly the right thing. I'm going to say OK. There's my pivot table. I'm going to use this to analyse by region. So I'm going to put that in as a top filter. I could put multiple filters up there, but this will be enough for me. Um, actually, I'm going to put area as well. Otherwise, it's pointless just saying it. Um, I'm going to have the invoice value as the value. I'm going to put the um, account number down the side and the analysis code below it again, because I think that looks quite effective. Um, do I put a rep across the top? Uh, yeah, let's put a rep across the top. So you can see which different sales reps have done what. Um, I could put the date in there as well. But that's boring, I've got to group it then. So here's my um, pivot table. So now I can sort of um, make it look mildly pretty, but before I do anything, I need to go to Analyze and options or right mouse clicking options to turn off that annoying auto fit. So that's now turned off. So now I can now resize it all so it looks presentable. And I can start using it. I say, okay, well, let's see what the sales were like in, um, no, I don't want region, I want area. That's so I should have named the other way around, really. Sales to the US. And I say, okay, there's the US. And if I want EU, I can say there's the EU. And if I want the UK, I can say UK, and then let's do the north of the UK. And you can have seconds of fun for only a lot of effort. 
So that's pivot tables. Well, like I say, any questions, feel free to ask. However, let me show you some other uh, cool stuff we could do to data. This is, um, this is that list of invoices that I started with. Should I use the other one because it's better? Um, no, yeah, the first one's better because it can be seen on the screen. So if I want to sort it by invoice number, um, I can right click on the invoice number, right click and go to sort and say smallest to largest. So now it looks tidy. If I want to sort by date, I can do the same thing. And when I do sort this time, nothing should happen. Yeah, because I would have made an effort to keep the dates in line with the invoice numbers. Because the last time I didn't do that, I saw an auditor almost have a heart attack. Um, if I wanted to sort by any of the other fields, I can sort by them. Now, one thing you can do with a list like this is you can use filter. Does anybody use filter at the moment? No? <coughs> Good. This will look mildly interesting then. Um, filter is really easy. All you do is you click on your data set, go to the ribbon at the top, click on the drop down, and select filter. And I've got a filter. Hurrah. So, this is like a really easy way of doing a pivot table. So, if all I wanted to do was to look at a particular account, I can click on the drop down and say, right, I just want account GK02. When I click on OK, there it is, there's that one account. Or if I just wanted to look at um, one particular rep, I can click on the drop down, choose one particular, well, to choose two reps. Let's be bold. There we go, two reps. Um, <coughs> You can tell it's filtered because the part that the line numbers don't add up anymore. They're also blue. Um, I can combine that by filtering with um, account number as well. So let's um, cross-reference one by the other. And you can do all sorts of um, analysis that way. Now, one of the things that you can do, of course, is um, you can put a total on it. Now, if I was to click down here and use our old friend Autosum, click there, hit return. I get a total. Yeah, that's easy. I could have just typed the sum function uh, manually, equal sum open bracket F2 to F19, and it would have done exactly the same. But then, of course, you think, like, yeah, let's analyze by and compare figures. So if I now choose um, a particular analysis code, then that figure of 8,000 goes down to 8,000. You think, like, well, that's no good. It's just giving me the total of all the hidden ones as well. This is because. Um, that's how it works. <laughs> and so if you want to get a total or a subtotal, we have to use a function called auto, they're called auto, called subtotal, which is equals subtotal. Then once you've opened the bracket, the important thing to type next is nine. And people go, why nine? And the answer is because that makes it work. So equals subtotal nine, and then you treat it like the sum function. So F2 all the way down to F19, close the brackets, hit return, I get the 8,125. But now if I select, um, let's just do one analysis code. It's done, that one, looking okay. I get the subtotal, easy, huh? Mm -hmm. um, and then of course I can analyze by reps and things and get different subtotals. You can do whatever analysis you like, and you can put in more than one subtotal. Uh, well, you can use subtotal function as much as you like, and you can use it however you like, because it doesn't have to be subtotal. The reason you have to put a nine in there is because that is the correct um, function type for the kind of thing you want to do. So here's the options. We could put one in for average. But that wouldn't be subtotal, that would be sub-average. But maybe sub-average is not a very friendly term, so they put subtotal and let you choose one as the type. And then you've got count and min and max and all that sort of stuff. But the one to do a subtotal as a subtotal is nine. And then um, that'll give you the total that changes when the stuff changes. So that's the subtotal function. Um, there's another thing which is cool if you want to do this sort of stuff, and that is grouping. If you've not used grouping, then on a list like this, grouping is great. I'm going to turn the filter off because I don't want to confuse the issue. Um, and I do that just by going to filter and clicking on filter. So I'm now, I'm now back to a standard list of data. And as always, this can be any old data. But what I want to do is I want to group it. And um, I'm going to group by rep. 
And this is a great way of taking a really big chunk of data, which this clearly isn't, and putting it into a size which is a bit more um, digestible. So if you're going through a spreadsheet doing an audit or doing um, a massive reconciliation of some kind, rather than going through this whole thing of like thousands and thousands of rows, if you can just break it down into little sections, you might find it um, easier to work with. And this is exactly what the grouping does. First of all, I'm going to sort it by those little sections, otherwise it won't work. So I'm going to sort by the rep. So I'm going to click in there, right mouse click, sort, doesn't matter how I sort, A to Z, or I could even be bold, reckless, and do Z to A. Okay, it just sorts. But it needs to be sorted. Then I can go to grouping, which I will find on the data tab. It's on the right hand side, and this is the outlining function. We can manually do um, uh, outlines or, um, <laughs> yeah, it's actually subtotals that I'm going to show you, not with grouping. Uh, but mm -hmm. yeah, we can manually do it by grouping and ungrouping, but I'm going to use subtotal function just because it's, um, yeah, it's a lot quicker, it's a lot easier to, um, to do it for the first attempt at subtotals. So um, it brings up this dialog box, which is a little bit, um, dated and user friendly, but it's not as complicated as it looks. The first thing is it wants to know um, at what point do I want to put in my subtotal, at what um, change. Well, the whole point of sorting by rep was to tell it that I want to do it by rep, so I'm going to select rep. What function do I want as a subtotal? Um, yeah, some will do. I'm actually not doing this for um, subtotals, I'm doing this to demonstrate grouping, but that's a useful thing. Um, it'll add up the totals. And then which field do I want to add up? Well, the only sensible one is value because the rest of them won't make any sense at all. That's ready now for me to hit OK. But I've got a few other options here. One is I can replace the current subtotals. I haven't got any subtotals, so that won't do anything. If I did have, then that would be a useful thing to keep picked. Um, the bottom one is summary data below. That will make more sense when you see the result, but you can put the, data, you can put the total below the list or you can put it above it. And this one in the middle it only really counts if you're going to print things out, but that will put a page break code in so you can print out one page at a time. Anyway, the point I'm making is by choosing a rep, which I've sorted by, and choosing a value, which it defaulted by, when I click on OK, I get this. Now, this is giving me subtotals, which is quite cute, but that wasn't the point I was making. <laughs> I completely forgot what I was about to do and led into this. Um, the, um, the point I'm making is I've got grouping tools at the side. So if I was trying to go through and reconcile and check all these invoices, then rather than do them all in one hit, because these, there could be lots of them here, I can just say, right, let's collapse the whole list. Let's collapse it down to level one. That's my total. Go, right, okay, that's my total of invoices. Now, um, I could just hit level two and expand it all to bring up all of the individual reps in this case. Um, and then I can expand it to three and see all of them. That defeats the point. What I want to do is I want to look at the ones that are LP. If I click on the plus, I can expand that list. I can go through it, check that list, work with that lot. Then when I'm happy with that, I can click on the minus to get rid of them. Then I can expand the list below and I can work on that. And so um, I keep staring over to the side. In case you're wondering why I'm doing that, it's because I've got a separate um, screen set up today with your, your uh, images on them. So I'm talking directly at you when I look to the, look at my uh, <laughs> right, as it may or may not be on your screen. Anyway, um, so um, so yeah, you can use these um, plus and minus to expand and collapse areas. It's just really handy for working with a big chunk of data. And you can add more levels to it. And you can get quite complex using the group and ungroup tool. But if you've never used it before, <coughs> the subtotal button just works a treat, does it all for you. And then when you get to the stage where you finish doing what you're doing and you don't want those on there anymore, you just want to get it back the way it was, you can go to ungroup and do stuff, or you can just click on the subtotal button and just say remove all. And now it's back to a normal list. So that's subtotaling, which, like I say, it looks a little bit um, dated, but it's actually quite a useful function. You just sort by the data, click somewhere within the data, press subtotal, and then choose that thing that you've sorted by and say OK. And now I can expand and collapse. Like so. Ta -da. Right, good. I shall now remove all that and um, 
and await further instruction. Um, <laughs> would anybody else um, like to see anything wonderful and exciting in Excel? Yeah, what was the um, wrap? What's that wrap key you've got? What does that do? The wrap? Yeah. That is for when you um, are creating spreadsheets about for heaters. And no, it's for when, um, if you have a, if you have a cell that um, you want to put lots of text, text in like this. When you hit return, it overlaps in Excel, unless the Excel has got something in it, and then of course it will truncate it. So what you can do is you can make this a figure or you can wrap the text. And if I want to wrap it while I'm typing, I can hold down the Alt key and press um, Control. So if I'm about there, I think, well, that's not going to fit in the cell. I can hold yeah. Alt and press, not Control, Return. I really right. haven't had enough coffee yet today. Hang on, obviously, it's going to be so cold. <laughs> mm. Still got caffeine in it. Um, alt and Return, and that wraps the text for me, which makes the row height deeper so that, um, see it. Alternatively, if you know that um, this cell or anything ever goes in that cell, it's going to need to be wrapped, then you can just click on this button beforehand. And that's now a cell that's going to be wrapped. And if this one, like a, a present on Christmas Eve, is also going to be wrapped, I can click there, then do stuff. And it will work just as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's wrapped it. That was really not as exciting as you thought it was going to be, is it? No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to see how these figures oh. get wrapped up. No, no, they just put on a second. No, no. Uh, Good. Any other requests? <laughs> no. I'll show you if statements one day if you're feeling really daring. Do that next week. If statements are great, oh, they're powerful. Yeah. But you've got, I can't be showing if statements and pivot tables all on the same day. That's, that's far too much. <laughs> no, just like, no, no, just, yeah, put you off the rest of the day. Um, okay, what I'm going to do then is I, I'm going to endeavour to um, go back to the thing we talked about yesterday. So this may not be that relevant. Um, I'm just going to show how to... Um, how to get a file attachment to somebody in a mail merge. So um, if anybody um, doesn't want to see this, um, then feel free to um, leave a wave goodbye now or nod off, um, or stick around in case you think of anything that you can ask questions about. Um, but predominantly, this is going to show using uh, show how CloudStation is used. Now, does anybody use CloudStation at the moment? No. No. Good. <laughs> That's good then. Yeah, excellent. Has anybody ever heard of CloudStation? Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that could you probably not use it for reason. Um, I'll explain what it is, um, and then I'm going to demonstrate how I'm going to use it, and then you can either, uh, either carry on not using it, or you might find that um, it's, it's changed your life. Um, <laughs> basically, if you want to attach a file in a mail merge, or even really in any um, email document, CloudStation is a great way of doing it uh, because you don't attach a file, you attach a link. I spent a good portion of my training time explaining to people that they should never click on links. However, it's still safer to email a link to a file uh, than to email the file itself because it doesn't matter how good your email system is, it doesn't matter how good the recipient's email system is, email is not secure. The second it leaves your server and is heading on its way to their server, it is exposed as plain text in the, um, in the whole of the world um, for billions of users to get hold of. And so if you think, oh, it's okay to send my credit card details in an email and just send it across or send a picture of a credit card, these things are not secure. It will just be visible to anybody and while it's out there in the, uh, in the wonderful world of the internet, anyone could grab it and use those details. And it's not just credit card details. It could be something like a payslip, which would be a GDPR breach if somebody decided to nick a payslip off an email and then start um, publicizing that data. Um, it could be something um, like a, a legal document or a contract that you don't want anyone else to know about. All of those things, or anything that's secure, or anything that's massive, you know, too big for an email, 
shouldn't be attached to an email. I want to say too big, you can't um, guarantee the size of these things. So even if you're just sending a picture, maybe you've got some high quality pictures of, um, of a vehicle or something you want to email to someone, you think, I don't care, there's no GDPR issue here. Um, but because of modern cameras, it's you know, really high resolution and stuff. Um, it doesn't, you can't guarantee um, that they won't be too big. And the reason I say that is because even if your internet provider says, oh yeah, we allow emails of 20 megabytes, which is really stupidly big, um, the person that receives them, their internet provider might, might only allow five megabytes. So there's nothing you can do about that. If you send a six megabyte file, it will bounce back and say this has exceeded space. Um, so really big files and secure files, they should all be stuffed into Cloud Station where they're nice and secure, um, password protected and shared. Well, that's the other way around, shared it and password protected it. Um, and then you've got a link which you can then give to people via email um, or put into a document that your mail merging. Um, which can then um, be opened and securely um, downloaded um, by that person if they've got the password. I think that made sense. Anyway, this is how it works. So um, what I'm going to do is open Cloud Station. Now, um, like I say, if you've never used it before, um, well, if you have used it before, this will be very familiar. If you haven't used it before and um, you've got a, a JJ Systems account, it will be included in your account. I can't remember exactly how much space you get included in your account, but you'll get an amount. Um, so the easiest way to get to it is to go to JJ Systems. I have no idea what was in that search history. <laughs> I might have to check that later before um, sending the film out. Um, the, um, the area of Cloud Station can be accessed via client logins. If I go to um, logins, there's up loads of our services and tools and things that are listed here. And the thing that I want is Cloud Station, so I'll click on that. And then I'll bring up the Cloud Station login box. So hopefully you'll all now have a nice blue screen that says Cloud Station. Yeah? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, fortunately, it's remembered my details from when I tested it earlier, so I can now just sign in. Like I say, if you've um, got a JJ Systems account, so the system that you log into your PCs on the network with, all you do is you type in first name dot surname and your standard JJ um, account password. Then when you sign in, you'll be greeted by something that looks remarkably like this. This. <laughs> um, it says file station, which isn't very exciting, but once I click on that, it only takes a single click. Then I get this. Now, um, again, this isn't very exciting, but once I double click on Cloud Station, I've basically got a standard file explorer. In here, there's a couple of folders. This is stuff that I use. Um, I can create folders, I can drag and drop files, I can do all sorts of things that I want to do. Or do anything I want to do with files, but what this is doing is basically storing my stuff in the cloud. Um, so it's, it's something that you're probably all familiar with doing these days anyway, putting files in the cloud. Um, it's really handy if you know you're going to need to access that file from somewhere else, but you don't know that you'll have access to your PC or access to um, you know, external data. Um, maybe um, you're going to a client site or you're going abroad or something, you just want to know that the data's there. Um, it's also a good way of working from home to put data, especially if your internet connection isn't great, you can put data in your Cloud Station folder, and then go home, then download it, work on it in the evening, or work on it for a week, put it back there, and when you go back to work, you can retrieve it again on your PC. Um, it's, um, it's got some advantages over, or got quite a lot of advantages over things like Dropbox. The thing about this Cloud Station is, this is on our server, or on our servers. Um, it's held um, on a, a physical file server that you can go to in Hurston and put your hands on, and know that it's real. Um, it's not some mysterious cloud that could be anywhere in the world. This is stored somewhere and is backed up to another location and is all secure and encrypted and all those other things. So all those things make it uh, GDPR compliant. And also it means that you can sort of be rest assured that um, where the data is. And you know you can literally go and see the machine if you 
really want to. Probably not at the moment because that wouldn't be allowed. But um, but in other normal circumstances. Um, so that's one of the things. Also, unlike cloud, unlike some cloud systems, particularly Dropbox, people can put data on here, but only when they've been requested. So if I request that somebody add data, um, then they can add data to it. But they can't just um, get an old password and start synchronizing files and put any old surprise stuff on there that then arrives on my PC. It could potentially be a virus. So Cloud Station is great for a variety of reasons. And like I say, it's included in your account. So it's even, uh, even great from a price point of view. But the one thing that really helps these days, and particularly since the um, advent of GDPR, is the ability to put on huge files or um, uh, uh, files that need to be secure and then email them. And the way we do that is um, we put them on here. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, I'm going to create a folder. So I'm going to right mouse click, create a folder, and I'm going to call this um, marketing, because that sounds like a good folder to store brochures in. Here's my marketing folder. Uh, now I'm going to go to the marketing folder. I'm going to put a brochure in there, um, which I don't have any. Um, so if I just reduce the size of that and find a file like the one that I had yesterday for doing the Excel spreadsheet, I'm going to drag that on and drop it in there. I don't know how much of this will come across on the screen, but basically I'm dropping an Excel sheet um, onto um, onto this part of the screen and it's called contact info and there it is. There's my contact info file. Alternatively, I could have done it in a manual way by right mouse clicking it and say upload to marketing and then select the file. Um, and I could have probably done it for one of these menus if I really wanted to, but um, it's just easy to drag and drop. So there's my file. So let's assume this is a document that I want to get to somebody. All I need to do now to make it visible to the outside world or shareable is to right mouse click, go to the very bottom and click on share. Then within this screen, um, it's telling me the file path, the share link. Is that coming up on the screen? Is it showing that properly? Yeah, yeah shared links, yeah. Yeah, good, just checking. Because yeah. yeah. <laughs> sometimes with these things, it doesn't always show the current uh, uh, dialog box that you're on. Anyway, so it says there, shared link and uh, file path. That's all important stuff, but we don't need to, um, to worry about remembering that or storing it anywhere. All we need to do here to get it ready to send to somebody is to say enable secure sharing. If you don't enable secure sharing, then it kind of makes it vulnerable to somebody finding it or hacking it or whatever you want to call it. Um, it doesn't take a lot of hacking to accidentally stumble across a file that's just sitting there on the internet. Um, even with brochures and things, it's, it's probably still a good idea to put a password on it just to reduce the risk of, um, I don't know, a risk of abuse. Um, so enable sharing, and then I'm going to say um, use a password because that's the easiest way. And then in this password box, I'm going to type in a meaningful password. I'm going to type in password like that, just because that's really secure. Um, obviously, you can make it something really detailed, but whatever you do, don't put the password in your email. When you send a link to somebody and say, this is our new brochure, and the password for it is password. Because if somebody intercepts the email, um, then they can get access. It might not sort of touch a big deal with a brochure, but if it's like a payslip, here's a payslip, and I've put my credit card details at the end of it. By the way, the password is hello. Not ideal. If you're going to send something like this, the best thing to do if you're sending a secure thing to an individual is to not type up the password, but to phone that individual and say, I'm sending you a secure document. You receive an email with a link. It's absolutely fine to follow the link. And the password is your date of birth or your middle name or your pet's favourite toy or whatever. I don't know. Um, so that's, uh, that's the way the security works. There's a few other options in here. There's get QR code. Now this is quite a cute one, I suppose, if you're using it to market a brochure or maybe a website, no, that would make sense, on a poster. If you wanted to put a link to the brochure on a poster, which would then have to say at the bottom, the password is, um, you could click on this 
And there's a QR code that you could stick on a poster and somebody could be sitting waiting for a bus thinking where it stand because those things are horrible to sit down in. We're standing waiting for a bus and they go, oh, I've always wanted that brochure. Scan it with their phone. Next thing they know, they've gone to the download page and they can download it. Um, so you can do that. I don't know anyone that's ever done that, but there's potential for it. But you can also set a validity period. Now, this is useful if you're doing something that is secure. You could say, I don't want anybody to get access to this file until Friday. Um, or you could say, I don't want anybody accessing this file after Monday. But by putting dates in there and even times, you reduce the likelihood of somebody accessing it where they shouldn't. You can even say only, you're only have to download it twice. And so it gives them one chance to mess it up. And then after that, so they can get it one more time and then, you know, it won't let them in a third time. So the validity period is a good idea. Plus also setting a stop time is just a great way of um, keeping it efficient and tidy because it means that after 1 a.m. on the 10th of uh, this month, this share will no longer be available. But it just keeps it efficient. So if I click on save, that's set to the validity period. So that's all detailed stuff, but in simple terms, all I've done is right mouse click on the file that I want to share, select the bottom option, which is share or sharing, and then in here, I've ticked secure, and then gone to share with others and put a password on there. That's all I've done. Now, when I click on save, what will happen is it will come up with copy to clipboard. I can ignore this thing about passwords. What it's done is now copy that link to the clipboard, that, that long link, which I don't want to have to make the effort of cutting and pasting. So it means that now if I go into my Word document or if I go um, into the mail merge or if I go into um, just a, a normal email, all I've got to do is paste this link. And then that will go to everybody in the uh, mail merge or anyone that I'm emailing or, or whatever else. And the link will look something like a link. And rather than sharing and unsharing in my page, what I'm going to do here is just click it in the URL at the top, which will look really weird. So if I just delete that and paste, that's what the link would look like. And, um, and then when they get their link, they can hit return on it and it will take them to a page that looks like this. It's quick as well. It's a lot quicker on a, a decent internet connection. So when they uh, click on the link, it will bring up a blue box which will contain um, a password prompt. And then if the person types the correct password in, which in this case was password, they'll be able to download the file. There's the file that I've just Go away, pass my prompt. This is what happens when you go just do the default answers on the training machine. Um, so now they can download the file. Sorry. So, Sorry. what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do that. And then she has a bit of panic about talking on the phone. There we go. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, so that's how you share files in a, um, uh, in a mail merge or share files with PowerStation generally. Easy as that. Exciting, isn't it? Good. Anybody got any questions about it? Yeah, if I'm, um, I could upload a Sage backup to that and potentially send that on as well, could I? Yeah, you could. So if yeah. you're sending it to your accountants, make sure yeah. you password protect it because you don't want the bad guys getting out of your accounts. Yeah. <laughs> but um, then just find the accountant and say, that suspicious email that I've just sent you. That's, yeah. that's fine, it's genuine, and it's um, from me, and the password is X, Y, Z. Yeah, yeah. and you give, him, you give him your password, do you? The one that you've, so you one that you've set up. That, that password that I typed in the box there earlier, that's yeah. the one. So you can have a unique password for everything that you share. Right, yeah. So okay. if you, stuff you're giving to the accountants, you might give your accountants a specific password. Uh, and stuff you're giving to clients, you know, you give them all individual passwords. And, and again, yeah. different things for different um, different items. Because okay, sometimes it's such a big file, you can't get it across like normally. So you have to, before we've used like Dropbox and that. Yeah. Um, I assume this is the same sort of thing, really. Very similar. But like I yeah. said, the thing about this, because it's hosted on our server, it means yeah. that um, you know where your data is. Yeah. Very secure. Yeah. Okay. 
and the server room is really secure. It's really cool. <laughs> so it's guarded 24 hours a day by guys that watch cameras. <laughs> right. And their, and their office is really secure as well. Um, but, uh, good. Okay. Does anybody, anybody have any questions about anything else? No, it's fine, thanks. Good. Yeah. Well, tomorrow I'm planning to do some PowerPoint training. Don't let that put you off. Um, you might find it useful. Um, I had a request um, from one of uh, the Monday's attendees um, to go through some of the finer features at the end of the PowerPoint training, you know, how to actually show the presentation and how to um, use the narration tools and stuff. And so I don't know how that's going to pan out on a webinar, but it'd be entertaining one way or another. So I'm going to do that tomorrow. Um, but having said that, if you think, well, I don't use PowerPoint, but um, I want to ask something about Word, then you can, you're can you more than welcome to ask tomorrow. Or if you could think of anything that you'd like to see, um, then you're more than welcome to make a request for stuff after tomorrow or next week. Um, anything you can think of, really. Okay, so, um, yeah, all right. So well, thank you for attending today. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks I'll see you soon. Have a nice day. Thank yeah, you. you too. Thanks, Glenn. Thanks, Glenn. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye.